good afternoon all of you this is the first uh, panel of uh, the aba conference which has members of parliament and uh, we have a representation from the east west north and south uh, i have uh, on my panel uh, dr kanimoi nmn somu she is from tamil nadu uh, uh, we have dr sasmith patra from odisha uh, Mr. Kartike Sharma from, uh, he represents the state of Haryana, Ami Yaknik, she's from Gujarat. So geographical spread is there and obviously the topic that we're going to discuss today, law, economic development and governance, role and responsibilities of Indian parliament. Uh, well, uh, we will first start with the round of introductory comments. These will be slightly long comments where uh, they'll go in detail on the topic and then we start with our questions. Uh, let me uh, request uh, uh, Ma'am uh, Ami Agnik to uh, start uh, her the round with the round of opening comments. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> to have parliamentarians in a law conference uh, where you've been hearing lawyers and judges and what happens in the legal arena and the judicial system and what happens to the litigants and their plight, we as parliamentarians are here. And I would like to highlight only that point, that parliamentarians make the law. And they make the law which then goes to the executive, where the law becomes functional. And then the lawyers come into the picture to use that law. And then comes the judicial system, where the judges interpret that law. But all these systems, from making law, to getting justice is meant for litigants who knock the doors of the court. I would make my last comment for whom these systems are made in the end. But today I would like to say that when parliamentarians have this serious onus of making law, we have to go back to post-independence era. Two transformational situations have taken place in our country. One that came with Nehruji's economic agenda. And that was concentrating only on social welfare, a welfare state, and equality for all in society. And a very, very strong parliamentary democracy, which of course stems from the Constitution of India that is supreme in our country. And that was put in place, in a way, by the Planning Commission, which also evaluated the five-year plans where the goals were set for economic development. Laws were made accordingly for the people who should receive this justice by using this law. And we had just gained independence, so we were a very, very new country in the colonized world. And this went on in 1990, and the second transformational stage came when we had a crisis in balance of payment. And at that time, the government took a decision of bringing liberalization policies to the country and do away with the license raj. So from then, we have liberalization, privatization, and the word globalization became the hub word in the country. And for that, when there's a regime change in this kind of a situation, economics changes, law changes, you have to bring law to suit that particular regime, to suit those policies, you have to bring reforms in those policies where you want to do away with a major part of the government and bring in private players. And so this is where these are two transformational changes when I look at the topic, that law, economic development, and the role of parliamentarians. So the parliament had the onus, being a major factor of parliament democracy, to make laws for the people of this country where they got the benefit of the development, they got the benefit of the economic policies, and they got the benefit of a social welfare state. So that is where I think the parliaments come up with different laws, they bring in bills, and the parliamentarians are supposed to discuss, threadbare these laws, deliberate upon them, have a thorough discussion and debate on it, and then to see that this law is absolutely 
holistic in its own way and it can be taken to the people of the country. And this law will help the people of the country to do what? To live as proper citizens and they should get the benefit of all the government policies. And so that is the idea behind having a parliamentarian making laws in the parliament. So we are the ones who make the laws in the parliament. I think the onus is on us to make the laws. Once we make that law, it goes to the executive. And they frame the rules, you know, they set up the institutions, they give the infrastructure, they, it goes to the state, the governments have to give them infrastructure for building courts, courtrooms, tribunals, and so on and so forth. Where do the people come in this? The people come because we are representatives of those people from wherever we come, the constituencies. And we find that they need a certain kind of a change in the law. And that is where we bring amendments to the law that is already passed. So this is the work of the parliamentarians as far as parliamentary democracy is concerned and our constitution is concerned. Our constitution is supreme. Everything else comes later on. And the parliamentary democracy has been the hallmark of India since 1947, and we are doing excellent. We have molded ourselves post-globalization. We have brought in policies as far as liberalization is concerned. We have learned along the way in the last three decades, and we have reached at a place where we have made our position very good in the global markets with private players coming from abroad and also trying to harmonize the legal systems in our country in order to see that foreign investments who come, which comes from abroad does not suffer. Uh, we'll take this forward, I think, uh, for the starting point, I would just like to say that we make these laws suited to the country's policies. We try to see that as we move forward in the 21st century, we are in the third decade, how we can make laws that can help the polity of this country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yagnik, for this opening comment. And of course, as you said, uh, policy certainty is what investors look for when they invest in a country. I'll go to uh, Karthike Sharma, his MP Rajya Sabha, for his opening comment. Thank you, Tharun. I'll, I'll pick up from where uh, my senior colleague, uh, um, you know, started. Uh, I think the particular issue at hand uh, deals with uh, three main manifestations, if you look at a historical perspective, from the last 75 years uh, that India has seen. We won our political uh, independence in 1947. We won our economic independence in 1991. And 2014 is a time where the middle class of the country, uh, the aspirational middle class, uh, it, they managed to uh, get the basic dignity, the, the, the basic chai walas, rickshaw walas of a country. They managed to come up uh, and aspire to be in the middle class. So these are three points where I see historically how tectonically there have been changes uh, uh, through the parliament and legislation. Of course, there's a lot which goes into multiple governments and successive governments that have taken place as during Nehruji's contribution, what uh, Amiji said. But uh, I think uh, when, when we talk about globalization, when we talk about where India stands today, we talk about the role of the parliament and the parliamentarians. It's very important to understand that yes, while the parliament makes the law, uh, the executive implements it, and the subordinate uh, legislation is not an issue which is governed by the parliament itself. But the kind of laws that have been brought in in the last eight years particularly have affected the common man in more than one ways. I mean, whether, uh, if, if I simply put it, we're looking at uh, the fourth industrial revolution. India seems to be, you know, from 2016 onwards per se, uh, the kind of policies brought in under this government uh, from that has been extremely encouraging to spearhead that fourth revolution for India as a country. So the digital transformation, the social transformation, the e-governance models, the, 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 the demand and supply gap that comes into uh, the governance mechanisms in the past we've seen, you know, the inefficiencies we've seen in the government schemes. Uh, we very infamously used to say um, that out of every rupee that you spend, 90 pesa goes waste. I mean, schemes such as the direct uh, benefit transfers. I mean, 
Schemes like that have been able to reach the last mile and the last person in the last years, uh, last eight years, and that has been extremely um, touching for the common man. I think uh, whether it is the Jandhan Yojana, whether it is Ujwala Yojana, and multiple schemes, about if I'm not wrong, about eight crore women have benefited out of the Ujwala, Ujwala Yojana. Two crore people have got housing, and so on and so forth. But the biggest advantage has been through instruments like UPI through Jandhan Yojana, where we have been able to transform our economy in a manner which has helped us to be more equitable in our approach. Uh, I think the bulk of the policies being made are also very equitable in its nature because they do not distinguish between caste, color, creed or religion. They are there for all minorities and majorities and I think it's an extremely important point to make. Uh, because, you know, the, the equity over here when we make law as parliamentarians is of paramount importance and I think that's what has been achieved by this government as well in the last eight years. And when we look back and see where India has reached in 75 years, I think we are very well placed to, uh, you know, accept that challenge and move on forward. Uh, today UPI is one of the largest um, uh, digital banking systems uh, run by the government which is working internationally and multiple governments globally are looking at it. So, I mean, there's a lot to, uh, you know, benefit out of this theme of law, economic development and government. Uh, a lot of laws made by the parliament are actually benefiting the common man in more than one ways. Uh, it's true, there's a, there are limitations when it comes to implementation, but that is the role of the, the executive and the judiciary as well. So I think everyone has to play their own part and uh, we've got a good start and we can really build upon it in the next 25 years from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that opening comment. In addition, even digital tolling saved a lot of money in addition to DBT. Also opening up the insurance sector uh, in a sense was a boost uh, and I think one of the good deliberations in parliament that we saw was during uh, that time. Uh, we'll go to uh, Dr. Kanimoi Somu for her opening comment. Ma'am, over to you. Good evening all. Uh, thanks for giving an opportunity to be a part of this. Uh, I thank my friend uh, Shashmish Patra who has taken so much of pains to bring us all, all this dais to talk about ourselves and what we really do in parliament. Thank you, sir. Uh, at the first moment, uh, my opening comment, are we really doing justice in parliament is what? Because Ami Ajmik, madam, has put up on the floor what is law, how is it going to be done, and what, uh, and my friend has also spoken. Now, any law which is being, we are the lawmakers, no doubt on that, any law which has to be done in the parliament, when it is taken up for the debate, is it enough of time given is my first question, which all my colleagues would accept the debate over there, what the time we get to look at a law before making it or to pass it is absolutely not enough for all of us. Then in case we send it to a joint committee, parliamentary committee or to any standing committees or anything, the reports come up, but how far it is executed, how far the uh, duations of all that has been taken into the uh, amendments of the law is what is more debatable today. Are we really following all that? Are people benefited because we are here for the people? Are we giving back? It's bi-directional. Are we giving back right to the people is more questionable of what we have to do. Like for an example, I as a doctor would like to bring up a medical uh, readdressal dispute uh, amendment. I'm still struggling for that in the parliament as a uh, member of the Rajya Sabha. It's not that easy these days for us as member of parliament just to bring a role. Maybe post independence as both my colleagues spoke was more easy to be bringing up. But these days getting anything onto board and for the discussion with all the opposition and the ruling party, with the discussions, with their uh, ifs and buts, taking forward, it's becoming more difficult for the parliamentarians also. One, next is on the floor. I, I, through your board, I would like the, this to be represented. One day for the opposition exclusively to put forth all their aggressions and redressals will make smooth operations of the parliament. At least we could pass all the other bills. We could become more productive because more time is required. The running of sessions are also less in number post-COVID because of the other uh, logistics. So how far we are putting forward in this is what I would like to look onto it. 
Thank you. Thank you for that opening comment. One thing I remain always hopeful is because the drug price control order that the Department of Pharmaceuticals issued many years ago came out of the efforts of one of your uh, member of parliament, Jyoti Midha, that time. She was a doctor. She used her knowledge of medicine and medicines then now were, uh, you know, people can avail at a, at a cost which was decided and capped. Uh, so good things do come out when MPs decide to take up a certain issue in Parliament. I'll go to Dr. Sasmis Patra, who's also an academic. He will give us the perspective uh, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I start, just want to thank Ms. Pratibha Jain for kindly inviting all of us here to this wonderful ABA conference. And a special word of thanks I'll take for a minute with my colleagues here, Dr. Ami Yagnik, Shri Kartike Sharmaji, Dr. Kanimuri Somuji. When I, in fact, approached them after having discussed with Pratibhaji, you know, without winking and eye blink, you know, they immediately said, yes, we will come. In fact, all the three of them have come on a Sunday from different locations, from Gujarat, from Tamil Nadu, from Haryana, for the specific purpose and will go back. That, that truly, that truly showcases that usually in a politician's life, Sundays are important because that's a day when most of the constituency work gets done because people at home. But that shows the commitment of parliamentarians per se to the idea that is being discussed today about how we can talk about the law in the present age of globalization. Having said that, let me come to the context of today's uh, theme, which we've got about 33 minutes left to discuss. It is about law, economic development, and governance, the contribution of parliament in India. My take is that we've had different governments coming to power and different finance ministers being there. But has it at any point of time, has the parliament been disruptive in terms of the agenda of lawmaking and economic development? Why do I say so? We all talk about legislations, we can talk about NCLT, we can talk about IBC, we can talk about GST, we can talk about Aadhaar, we can talk about various forms of legislations. But I believe the biggest piece of economic development contribution that the parliament does, which does not come within the realm of a law and therefore doesn't get discussed, is the union budget. Presently, the union budget is being discussed in Parliament. We are going through a recess. And Mr. Shroff is there. He's a doyen and a stalwart of the judicial process and the industry of, of uh, legal luminaries of this country. I went to just think, Mr. Shroff, that if in case the union budget would not get passed by the union government by the 31st of March 2023, what would happen? Can the state draw money from the Exchequer and the Consolidated Fund of India on 1st April 2023. So therefore, it raises a basic point that irrespective, and yes, there have been governments which have been minority numbered governments. There also have been governments that have got fractured mandates. There have been governments that have run on coalitions. There have been governments that have run on oxygen. But at the same point of time, Never once has the parliament been disruptive in order to stop the passage of the union budget, which is a money bill. Doesn't have to come to the Rajya Sabha, understood. But even in the Lok Sabha, the finance bill and the appropriation bill needs to be passed. And while it is being passed, if there is a vote of no confidence and the government breaks and the union budget is not passed, then as per the constitution, I'm very limited in my sight, Mr. Shroff can explain it better. What would happen on 1st April 2023? And that is where I believe, of course, there can be different legal interpretations of that. It's a point of law. It's a point of constitution. But the bigger concern is that the Indian parliament, I see that bright light, that irrespective of tugging at each other on the tenter hooks of politics, never once has the Indian parliament ever exceeded its brief on being disruptive as far as the money bills have been concerned. 
So despite different agendas and different ideologies, the Indian Parliament's contribution to the idea of law, economic development, and governance singularly has been ensuring that despite our differences, we stand as one when it comes to ensure and passing the union budget despite our reservations. And I believe that is the bright spot from which I would start. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your opening comment, uh, Dr. Patra. I'll go to Dr. Kanimozi Somu. Ma'am, you highlighted this uh, uh, point where you said that the parliament, in a sense, has a limited role because execution after the law is made is largely in the hands of the executive. But sometimes laws with a very high impact have also been made. I think NCLT and NCLAT that came out of deliberations in parliament has greatly helped uh, the dispute uh, resolution in sense the insolvency process is something that is we now discuss day in and day out. Could you also highlight any other examples where the parliament has played such a role which has had a far reaching impact? In your view it could be historical over the years. Yeah. When you talk about uh, <coughs> implementation uh, I think there appear several bottlenecks whenever a new law comes. And to take it right to the ground, it becomes very difficult. I will just give you one example. In, say, 2001, there was a conference going on of uh, celebrating International Women's Day. And there were all legal luminaries and justices sitting there, and they were discussing about women empowerment. And there were two women there, and I was one of the speakers. And I was wondering that we are all in a hall celebrating International Women's Day, but 95% of my women in the cities and the rural areas do not even know that there is a day carved out for them, and they, they have to celebrate this day. So that brings us to a point that when the laws are made for a certain section of people, whether it's a business community, whether it is, let's say, arbitration, or whether, let's say, it's um, sexual harassment at workplace, or domestic violence at home, and after the nearby account, we also had that there should be no cyber stalking. That was also taken. So public space, domestic sphere, and workplace, all three have been taken care of by law, and yet we find that women are still feeling that insecurity and are feeling unsafe. So when you say that when there's, a, when there's an implementation of law, there are several, several bottlenecks. The rules take a lot of time to be framed. The infrastructure takes a lot of time to be placed there. And for whose benefit the law is made is at a complete dead end. They do not know how to be made. I mean, they, don't, they are not made aware of that. So whether there are industry associations who will every day tell them that today there is an amendment, Today there's a GST council that has set and then there's a change in this. Then there is another tax that is going to come. This is going to be some kind of a, a break-even policy for you. So heavy industries take a different uh, policy. For light industries, for micro industries, it's absolutely different. For middle industries, it is different. And then we talk about women cooperatives at the level of the village. Give them infrastructure and the women will come together. And then we will see that they have a digital platform. But 41% of women don't have mobile phones. What about the digital platform? Where is the access? So the final word is the access. Where is the meeting point of the law that is made, the infrastructure that is to be set, and the access which has to be given to these people? It is equally relevant for business communities, commercial transactions, foreign direct investment coming from other countries to our countries, export import policies and any other uh, form of law that is meant for children. That is one aspect where the children are most neglected. They have rights. We talk about children's rights. We have organizations. But the children don't know that they have a right. They have to be protected. They have to be safe. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Mr. Karthike Sharma here. Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced uh, that he wants to make India, he sees India becoming a hub of arbitration, following which the parliament passed the New Delhi Arbitration Centre Bill. Justice Hemant Gupta was just here in the previous panel. Uh, but I remember a conversation I had with you a couple of years ago. You said you were in talks with foreign partners who were investing with you in India. They were insisting on foreign seated arbitration. And you had, I remember that time, told me that you were insisting that the arbitration should happen in India. So it is one thing to make law and the other thing to make it successful. Yeah, it's true, Tarun. The biggest problem is that uh, people want to do business in India, but they don't want to abide by Indian laws. 
So, you know, the, the impetus is either, uh, you know, you, you go and do arbitration in Singapore or in London or, uh, and this is not coming from a perspective of a lawyer. This is coming from a perspective of a person who deals with international entities. So, uh, you know, ultimately you have to come to, the, to India to get the law implemented anyways. The, the hesitance and reluctance of signing on to Indian laws is an issue and that's perhaps because of the inefficiencies that plague uh, you know, the systems, the contracts, the ability to implement contracts in India, that has been a problem. I think the government has systematically tried to address a number of those issues and uh, uh, through these arbitration centers and the proactive approach of uh, resu resolution, uh, you know, rather than just uh, creating disputes and going to the court all the time, is the right approach for business, ease of doing business, conducive for growth and that's what even the people who are putting in the money are expecting. And India has to live up to that expectation. I think a lot of right moves are being made over there. Uh, uh, but having said that, I think the biggest uh, example of making laws which affect people intrinsically at a very fundamental level, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2016 is when Startup India was initiated, right? It was brought into action. And uh, there were 471 startups in 2016. Today, and, and to, uh, I, I partially agree with Amiji that law is evolutionary, it has to evolve. Even after you pass a law from the parliament, the, you know, it will take its time and it will evolve in a particular um, framework as you know, things and situations will evolve over a period of time. But having said that, you have to look at, uh, look at it from a longish perspective as how is it bringing change, how is it impacting the common man. So for instance, uh, if you look at, in 2016, 471 startups, as if of last year, we had something close to 13,000 startups, out of which 3,300 of them are registered. 4,400 of them are in the uh, space of climate change, IoT of things, which is actually affecting and helping bring in efficiencies, you know, and also helping us bring about uh, positive changes, whether it's towards the environment or even through the, uh, towards reducing the losses by bringing in efficiencies. Now, we've had more than 100 unicorns in the last year. So obviously it's a time-taking process. What has been done in 2016 has culminated in over the period of years and is ultimately bearing fruit. Now, what, is, what was fundamentally done? We had problems with taxation, we had problems with structuring, uh, especially in the startup space, you couldn't place uh, equity, you couldn't place uh, you know, equity uh, uh, without attracting certain uh, violations under the Income, Ta Income Tax Act where you were booking profits or assume profits and a number of these problems which were uh, being faced by people who were completely at a disadvantage and not having the know-how of how to go about it. So the law actually helped them in structuring, in raising monies, in income tax exemption, in, being, in bringing it into a formal structural environment which allows them, uh, gives them a conducive environment to grow. And that is what ease of doing business is about. That is what the, the new uh, ecosystem is about. When we talk about India having a pole position in the fourth industrial revolution or being ahead of the curve, this is exactly what we're talking about, giving that digital infrastructure the social transformation, the social digital transformation, that we are ready to actually handle the, uh, the, you know, for a country of our size and scale, to grow at the level that we have, given the problems that we have and the noise that we have. My uh, esteemed uh, senior colleague, uh, Mr. Patra, was talking about the, the problems that we face in the parliament about I mean, getting the house to function and getting more time and being able to speak and keep, keep our perspective out there. You know, it's very unfortunate. Um, I remember uh, 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 a former prime minister, Mr. Vajpayee, used to say that that's the beautiful, uh, beauty about in the Indian politics and in the parliament that we uh, put uh, nation above politics. But unfortunately, we are seeing that, that things are changing right now and not for the better. So we, we really need to, as parliamentarians, also need to introspect and look at how we are benefiting the common man. So law is definitely helping in that process. I'm a firm believer of that. And that's just one of those examples. Thank you. Thank you. Giving that perspective on business, law and lawmaking and also startups. I remember a very interesting discussion I saw in parliament long years ago. It was on drought relief. And uh, during that time, certain districts didn't get the relief that they should. And in parliament, somebody told that, but no, you have had adequate rainfall, so why do you want this? So one parliamentarian should have stood up and said that my district is fairly large. 
it has a mountain and it has plains both. There was more than average rainfall on the mountain, but in the plains there was barely any rainfall. So what effectively happened is that they are facing drought-like situations, but uphill things are still barely okay. So we would need some funds there. So you know, I when I saw this, because the data which was presented before parliament gave the average rainfall figure for the district. and but, but the district is so large that, you know, there can be two different conditions. These kind of things we learn when we see parliamentary debates. I'll go to Dr. Uh, Kanimoi for her comment on what has been spoken by the other panelists. Over to you, ma'am. As uh, rightly uh, Karthik had said, are we really contributing to it? On that, I would just like to highlight uh, one point. Now, what we do in parliament is executed as a law. Now, who has to execute the law? Is it being done right? Supposing certain laws are being passed down to the states, is the states going forward and implementing it? Who is to take care of this? See, the parliament cannot sit and see who is, is every state promoting the law or implementing the law, especially the food safety bill, which is implemented to all the states, which is still in so many states within the courts, not just on papers and not in the implementation. So this needs to have some kind of uh, communication between the uh, parliament, the lawmakers, and the law. And next is whether the common people really understand these types of laws are come up in the parliament. Only for an example, don't mistake me, Nirbhaya case comes up. Only then what kind of laws and IPCs and criminal codes are there when it comes up in the TV or the WhatsApp or the newspapers, the common people come to know. Otherwise, what is framed in the parliament, it comes up in the next the newspaper and it doesn't even reach the common man. Only when there is a crisis, it has to really reach the common man. Now, who is to uh, streamline all these things? How are we going to take forward to the common people? Because we are doing all this in favor of a common man for the people. What system are we there having it? I would like to place that. Thank you, Thank you for that intervention. I'll go to Dr. Sasmit Patra for his comment. Well, all my three colleagues have very elucidly, lucidly provided their views. I have one aspect which I want to share with the audience today. We call ourselves lawmakers. Parliamentarians are lawmakers. But are we actually lawmakers or are we only passing the law? Because we have little or less involvement in terms of preparing the law. Who prepares the law? It's the executive. The ministry prepares the law, vets it through the ministry of law, and then it comes to the parliament. Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha. Then the parliamentarians sit, then they debate and discuss, they provide certain suggestions for amendments. Usually the government of the day, in the last 70 years or even the last 20, 25 years you will see, usually the government of the day does not take very kindly to these suggested amendments. You can call it as ego, you can call it as uh, we know it better, or a sense of admission saying that probably we didn't do our homework right and therefore the floor of the parliament is correcting us and that should not be. Either ways, I'm not going with any government. Last 25, 30 years, if you see, the amendments being proposed on the floor of the house, how many amendments are proposed and how many are actually accepted while passing of the law? That itself raises a pertinent question about lawmaking. That if 99.99% laws are prepared by the executive, by the secretary and his team inside the ministries, passes the legislative scrutiny in the ministry of law, comes to the floor of the house and is discussed in four hours flat and becomes the law of the land, then are we truly lawmakers? Or are we passing a law and debating and deliberating on the finer points of it? Now let me come to the second aspect. When such a law goes for legislative scrutiny, mind these two words, we have judicial scrutiny, we also come about legislative scrutiny. When that happens, in the standing committees of parliament, let's say I used to be on the standing committee of law and justice. 
Just about six months back, we had the mediation bill which came for scrutiny of the Standing Committee of Law and Justice. So let's say, for example, there are a number of recommendations that have been made by the committee. But when that law comes again as a bill on the floor of the House after the legislative scrutiny, are those suggestions accepted or not? I'll give a very small example and I'll close. We had the data protection bill come in Parliament. You're all aware of it, right? The data protection bill came. Then it went for a select committee. The select committee proposed 100 changes. And then it was withdrawn. And recently there is some discussion about whether it has been passed by the committee or not. I'm not going into it. All I'm trying to tell you is, as parliamentarians and as parliament, we need to rediscover and reinvent our understanding about lawmaking. Unlike many, we do not have time, so I cannot dwell on other parliaments and other democracies and how they make laws, how an individual member of parliament can also bring in a law and can be supported unanimously. Those things do not exist in our system. So therefore, I'd like to conclude, parliament has to also reinvent and rediscover its role that is it only for debating and discussing a draft that comes on the floor of the house prepared by the executive to be passed by the legislature, or should the legislature also start empowering the parliamentarians that you also provide your private member bills, they will be also passed if it finds merit, irrespective of the government of the day. Otherwise, we'll be passing laws, not creating them, depending on the nuances. Thank you. Very pertinent point raised by Dr. Patra. I'll go to Dr. Ami Agnik. Ma'am, uh, Lack of deliberation, is that uh, an issue? Do you think sometimes in parliament, less opportunity to speak, lack of deliberation, or uh, could, you, uh, could you speak on that point, please? Well, of late, <clears throat> you find that the days of the parliament sessions have been reduced, if you compare to the past decades, and we are working quite uh, for less days, if you see in a year. And during that time also, of late, in the last couple of years, we lost to corona. Many, many crucial bills were passed in a sense that without uh, deliberation, which was required, duly required. And when a bill comes, as uh, Dr. Patra said, that it is prepared by the executive, but it is the need of the day. For example, we have come with, say, we want to go digital. So we need to have a law uh, as far as digital platforms is concerned, social media is concerned, how do you govern them, how do you control them, how would you give access to the village level, to the rural infrastructure. So all these would come in the executive, they'll prepare the bill, they'll send it to the parliament. As individual parliamentarians, I come from Gujarat, so I would like to look at what will it do to my people in my constituency, so what would be their problems, and I would discuss that, and I would talk about that in the parliament. So would Dr. Patra, he would bring it from his state, that, well, we just don't have that kind of an infrastructure. We need more funds. This uh, loopholes have to be plugged. This has to be removed. This clause will not work. This uh, portion will not work. So each one would have a say. But the time has to be given. It can't be just uh, run and go in a, a, a jiffy. And that is what has been happening in the last couple of, of years I'm seeing. And so the discussion doesn't come. So the constituency's problems do not get reflected in our deliberations or debate. And the bill gets passed. No problem, the bill gets passed. It becomes a law. But then it gets, goes to the Supreme Court. That is ultra virus, the Constitution. We want to take it to the Supreme Court. So that ultimately, somewhere there is a check and balance. So it goes, ends up somewhere or the other. Because some community, some section is practically feeling that it is at a disadvantage. We should have been heard. We should have, this point should have been brought before the parliament. This is giving a problem. And secondly, this bills should be sent to a select committee or a standing committee. So where the parliamentarians sit and they discuss and deliberate on that, can, no, this will not work. This is my suggestion. And that forms a report. And again, it comes for scrutiny. And again, it is put before the House. That is how I think that exercise should be undertaken, so that the law becomes a foolproof law. It is meant to give justice, redressal to people. It is not just a paper exercise. We are doing it so that people can use it so that they can get justice. 
So that is practically uh, needed, more time to be given for deliberations. There should be more input from every stakeholder rather than just brush aside and make it a mechanical exercise of passing it. Thank you, uh, and I like take the same point to uh, Mr. Karthike Sharma about a opportunity to speak in Parliament, but that also a lot of work happens in uh, the parliamentary committees. If you can reflect on that also, uh, I couldn't agree more with my senior colleague uh, Amiji. Uh, we need to have more deliberation, have more discussion, more time. Uh, whatever I've seen, I think I'm the youngest. Uh, out of all the parliamentarians here in the parliament. So my experience is a little more limited than theirs. But what I have seen since I've been there, uh, you know, uh, there are parliaments in the world, I believe, which run concurrently throughout the year as well. So yes, it's true that we get lesser time. But whatever less time we get, also because of various factors, we don't get productivity out of them. And Amiji could also perhaps, uh, um, you know, shed some light on that. But uh, I mean, for example, in the last uh, uh, session, uh, the, the first part of the budget session, we could hardly get any time to speak. I, I, I'll give you a personal uh, uh, example. You know, I've, I've been still waiting for my maiden speech because the house hasn't functioned. And I have this my third session that I'm attending so far after becoming a member of parliament. And uh, I was finding, and, and I, am, uh, uh, I am an independent, so I don't, I am not subscribing to any political party, which makes it even tougher for me to get my voice heard in the parliament. So, uh, and I think we have to do something about it ourselves. Uh, I agree with all my colleagues. So I did take on uh, the initiative. I wrote to the Honorable Chairman of the Raj Sabha, and I said that, sir, I'm sure that the founders of our constitution and the forefathers did not intend that independents and uh, smaller parties do not get representation because uh, political parties get time allotted and, um, uh, you know, then they further allot time to the members. So, you know, th that we should not be treated as political transgenders just because we are independents or come from smaller parties. And he was kind enough to actually, uh, you know, um, and I was surprised that this, has ha this hasn't happened for uh, the last 75 years, but he was kind enough to actually call us, call the independents and uh, form a group of all the independents and treat them as a separate group and allocated us time. So, I mean, yes, we did not get our voice heard, but we made efforts to see, ensure that our voice was heard. I, I ended up raising about 16 questions in the last eight days that the parliament functioned. So, you know, we all have to do our bit. I don't come from a political party. I don't hold a brief for any one of them. But you have to call a spade a spade. If there's good work being done by the government, you should call it and say, yes, good work is being done. And that's exactly the point we were trying to make earlier in our conversation. So yes, I think we have to uh, make efforts at a personal level. Also, we have to uh, continue working. Uh, the, the, the whole idea of lawmakers being uh, more informed, being be able to take more informed decisions. I'll give you another example. My senior colleague spoke about uh, the data protection bill. I, I happen to be on the communications and IT committee and uh, this matter was deliberated and uh, um, discussed at length. Now, they, these are complicated issues. Now, this is an issue which we are at the same cusp as the rest of the world. You know, there, there isn't any um, um, difference between what's happening globally in the West or any other parts of the world. So we've, we've got to le learn from each other. We need to have, a, have the exposure, the know-how, the ability to understand because these are disciplines that affect multitude of people in multiple manifestations. It's not just one aspect of thing. There are more than five to six different ministries that get impacted from it, and it affects and touches an individual in more than one way. So we need to understand in much detail to even be able to advise the government to change the law. So I completely agree with them. We have to have an informed decision. We must be more exposed to it so we can actually contribute to the process of lawmaking. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that free and frank view of what you experienced as an independent parliamentarian and how things can be improved. I'll go to Dr. Kanimui. Ma'am, uh, your uh, uh, inputs on deliberations, work that happens in committees, uh, and also, uh, you know, that sometimes laws do get challenged, then in that process a lot of time gets wasted because you, know, you spend time deliberating and then passing, then it gets challenged, goes to the courts. Uh, if badly drafted laws can end up in courts. Could you reflect on all of this? As uh, Ami Madam said, it comes from the Secretary of the Ministers. I think I, they can do the paperwork, it can come to a committee even before it could reach the parliament, where the committee could consist of all the state representing MPs, because every state, ecologically and climatically, we are all different. We are a subcontinent, we are just not a country. With so much of different climatic conditions, each law 
imposes different aspects on each state. So everybody can be there, we can correct things over there, and then it can be brought up to the parliament on the floor for discussion. Because with just 120 days or 90 days of working of days of parliament, with so many laws being put up in front, we hardly give just 12 hours to 16 hours of debate, which is definitely not going to be enough for the law of the country to be framed just within a 12 to 14 or 16 hours of debate. So I think this kind of a derivative, if it has been done from the secretary, it goes to a committee first, where it comprises of all the legislative uh, sitting of all the states and everybody, and then it comes up as the law which is drafted properly. Then they take it up on the floor for discussion, what amendments need to be added and what need to be deleted. And then if it is passed, I think the Supreme Court will also not be facing that much of uh, difficulty will be my thing. And I would also be very happy if there is more participation from the member of parliament side, because I think all my other colleagues on the stage uh, would accept, most of them don't attend. We have nominated members. I would like to bring that up. It is absolutely no attendance at all. I think we really need to look onto that, that six, I think it is six in number. I think that six people can be really given to some other people who will do real good to it. I think attendance should be made compulsory even for the parliamentarians. I think uh, all of us on stage are holding two professions, but still we all four of us, uh, three of us try to make it up with all the good attendance. I think that also should be made mandatory for the parliamentarians to be more productive. It should be uh, both the ways, not only from their side, from our side also we have a role of... Uh, they should have performance league incentives. Exactly. Yeah. I think that has to be rated also. It, the uh, report cards need to go home, I think. I think that would be a better choice. So, Dr. Patra, well, thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Patra, we have about 3 minutes and 20 seconds remaining. You, so start, you started this point, so I think you should conclude it now. Yeah, so <laughs> I have 3 minutes and I'm at the end, so I can afford to be harsh. <laughs> and why? i tell you something. I, I mean, I was just referring to what uh, former Chief Justice Ramanna mentioned during his tenure. He says it becomes very difficult for us to interpret a law because there's no debate happening inside the parliament. And because there's no debate, how do I understand the social impact of a law? And if I, because every time we talk about constitution, we go back to the constituent assembly debates whether it's in the Supreme Court, any courts, whenever a point of law happens, it's usually the Constituent Assembly debates are referred to. When certain laws that are being passed today are discussed, are debated in the judiciary, and they go back to the debates, what will they find? Will they find volume? Will they find substance? Will they find the for and against? But here, we can of course berate the parliamentarians, we can of course berate parliament per se, we can berate the politicians that they're not doing their job. But I would also like to be a little harsh on the citizens as well. Why? Because apart from tweeting and saying that the parliament is not doing its job and the politicians are sleeping at their job and sending memes and looking at tweets and reels, beyond it, what is 1.4 billion people's response to the parliament? Either it's of abject sense of disgust, nothing good will happen. So why bother? Look, you can't outsource your democracy to parliament. You can't. If outsourcing of freedom was there, then the free freedom of India wouldn't have been won in 1947. I believe somewhere we have got democracy on a plate today that we would express ourselves on social media, but we would not take a step of going and asking as a group to the a single parliamentarian of my constituency that look, you have failed on your duty as a parliamentarian, you should not be paid your salary. I am yet to hear a single PIL being filed anywhere in the country which says parliamentarians should not be paid their salary or the daily allowance of 2,000 rupees for disrupting parliament. And I'm not talking about only this government, the previous government, this government, any government you look at, any disruption, not only in parliament, in state legislature. I have 47 seconds, I'll just give you one example. I am the opposition party, the Biju Janata Dal from Odessa. I'm an opposition party in the parliament. But my government is run by my chief minister, Naveen Patnaikji, in Odessa. So the government here, when we are in parliament, we do not disrupt it here. 
In our own state legislative assembly in Odessa, we also expect no dis disruptions, but we find disruptions there. So you cannot say that disruptions should not be here in parliament, but wherever you are in opposition, you will say, let's do disruptions there. I believe the citizenry and especially the young people here who are going to become lawyers, I'm sure you will have a wonderful career. But don't outsource your democracy to parliamentarians and parliament and say, our job is done because I'm a taxpayer. It's not a catering system. You have to take responsibility. And you have to put the money on the table as far as the parliament and the politicians are concerned. If you do not do it, I may be more harsh, the parliamentarians would bother. You have to put them on the table. You have to call them for what they are. But you cannot do it only on social media. You are lawyers, you can have interventions through judiciary, call them to prove their worth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and I would like to end with a point that India still ranks 167 among 190 nations in the enforcement of contracts. That itself is a big explanation of how far we have to go to make the business environment and the environment uh, uh, in a sense for doing business better. Of course, we are, make, uh, you know, we, we are improving each day, but there is a long way to go. Uh, but I would like to thank each one of you. you. You represent all different parts of India. You made time, you came here, and you, in a sense, enriched this gathering. Thank you so very much. Thank you.